Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning. How are you all doing? It's almost the weekend. I know, I'm so excited. I get super jazzed every Thursday because I'm like, it's almost Friday. Um, I don't know why, it's not like I get to sleep in anymore, but I still get pretty excited about the weekend. Um, I imagine that will follow me through to like retirement or whatever. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're gonna start with a little warm up where we're looking at double-sided hypothesis tests. So I'm gonna get you guys started on one and I'm gonna let you finish it up. So what I want you to have open on your computers is I'd like you to have your Z table open as well as that hypothesis calculator that's under the technology section of unit six. So go ahead and take a couple seconds to get those two things open. So the Z table, which was from unit four and the hypothesis test website calculator, which is from unit six. So while you guys are doing that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and take a look at the example that we're gonna work on today. So, Okay. So unit six. I thought this is just. So, we've heard 28% of teenagers go to bed before 10 p.m. We believe this is different so we randomly sample <clears throat> 83 teens and find 23 go to bed before 10 p.m. So we've heard that 28% of teenagers go to bed before 10 p.m. We believe this is just different, so maybe less, maybe more. So what we do is that we randomly sample 83 teenagers and find that 23 go to bed before 10 p.m. All right, so the first thing that I would like us to do is to set up the hypothesis test of the null and the alternative. So the null hypothesis is that we think that the percentage of teenagers that go to bed before 10 p.m. is 28%. And all, our alternative hypothesis is that it does not equal 28%. So we just think it's different. We don't know if it's more or less. So we're gonna say that it's not equal to 28. And I always draw this out. So we're going to have 28% in the middle here. Now remember, we're looking for extremes on either side. Now, the thing that's weird about looking for extremes on either side is that you're looking for the probability that you see a sample that's just as extreme as yours. 
So if our sample has an extreme value on this side, we also want to know the probability that our sample also had an extreme value on the other side. So of course, we're only going to get our sample to display one side because we only have one sample. So what this means is that to get the p-value, that is the probability we see something as extreme as our sample, after we find this value on our p-table, we need to multiply it by 2. All right. Now, the second thing that we're going to do for this problem is something that we haven't done before. But we want to confirm that the central limit theorem criteria are met. So in other words, whoops, <laughs> is our sample good? Now it's been a hot minute since we talked about the central limit theorem. And even before that, we didn't usually call it the central limit theorem, we call it the C. Um, CLT, or we were just asking, is our sample good? So the first thing that the central limit theorem requires us to ask is, is our sample random? So rando? Yes, so. Why, oh? Because we said so. Okay, and something important to remember, especially when you guys are gearing up for your exam, is that if it is random, it reduces bias, which increases accuracy. Now, the second thing that we want to look at is we want to look at see if our sample is big enough. So to see if our sample is big enough, we want to confirm that we have 10 successes and 10 failures. So are we going to be projected to have 10 successes and are we going to be projected to have 10 failures given a sample size of 83? So when we're calculating when we have 10 successes or 10 failures, we're trying to see if the sample size that we're choosing to use is big enough before we even gather the sample. So to figure out if we have at least 10 successes and 10 failures, we need to take 83 times well, out of those 83 people, how many do we think are actually going to be successes? That is, teens that go to bed before 10 p.m. Well, we would expect 28%. Okay, and when we do that math, we figure that this is greater than 10, so we are good. And for failures, we do the same thing. So we're going to have 83 times 1 minus that 0.28. So if you're not in the 28% group, that's a success. That means that you're going to be in the 72% group, that's a failure. And we also get that that is greater than or equal to 10. So that means that we are good to move forward with the rest of our hypothesis test. <clears throat> All right, are you guys okay if I move this uh, paper? Okay, cool. All right, so the third thing that we are going to want to do is actually start running our numbers. 
So we want to find the standard error p hat p naught and our z test statistic. So when we're finding our standard error, what we are going to do is we are going to have the square root of 0 0.28 times 1 minus 0 0.28, all of that divided by our sample size, which is 83. Okay, and we are going to get 0.28 times 1 minus 0.28 divided by 83. We're going to get 0 0.0493. All right, then to figure out the p hat, we're going to have 23 divided by 83. So 23 over 83. That's going to give us 0. 2771 and our p hat p hat p hat is 0 0.28 all right the last part is that we need to find our z test statistic so that's going to be our p hat minus our p naught divided by our standard error. So when you're entering this into a calculator, just a reminder, it's really important to put those parentheses around the top. That way you're telling your calculator, I need you to subtract this first and then divide. Mm -hmm. All right. So when we do this, we're going to get a Z test statistic of negative 0 All right, so the last thing I want you guys to do is I want you to find that p-value using your z-score table, and then I want you to confirm that you actually found the correct p-value by using that unit six technology, that hypothesis test calculator. So when you guys are ready to move out into your groups, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. All right, cool. So I will put you guys into breakout rooms and I'll probably just give you like four minutes to find that p-value by hand and plug it into the online calculator and then talk to each other and see if you got the right or not the right, the same answers. So there you go, go for it, go to your rooms. It's still really good. So <clears throat> after we click on the hypothesis testing calculator, we enter in the null proportion, our sample proportion, the sample size. We make sure they're all alternative hypothesis correct, hit calculate, and we get our probability. So our z-score and most importantly, our p-value. Also, if you scroll on down, you can see the picture where it says, hey, you have a two-sided hypothesis test so you know that you made the right choice when you clicked up here. So before we move on real quick, any questions on that part? Nope, looking good. All right, so the last thing we want to do is we want to state our conclusion. 
So remember, if they don't state an alpha, we can assume that our alpha or a significance level is 0 0.05. <clears throat> and since our p-value is so much higher than that, then what we say is we say that we fail to find evidence to reject H naught or some variation of that. Okay, great. Now, the next thing that we're gonna talk about <clears throat> today is gonna be the last part of this unit. And what that is going to be is running in a hypothesis when you have two samples. All right, so when you run a hypothesis with two samples, first thing is first, you're gonna have your sample one, and you're gonna have your sample two. <clears throat> Now, your first sample is going to have some sort of proportion, so we call that P1. And your other sample is going to have some other proportion, we're going to call that P2. Okay, those are both our samples and our sample proportions. Next, our samples can be different sizes. So this is going to be the size of sample one and n sub two is going to be the size of sample two. Now, when we're doing two sample hypothesis tests, what we're going to do is that we're really only interested in setting up the null hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis properly. After that, we're going to let technology do the work for us, and then we need to state our conclusion. So when you're comparing two samples, you're still going to have your null hypothesis. And your null hypothesis is that you're always going to assume That these populations are equal. And your alternative hypothesis is going to be the same as our alternative hypothesis before. So you could say that P1 is less than P2. You could say that P1 is greater than P2. Or you can say that P1 just as an equal P2. Now, <clears throat> depending on the program that you're using, sometimes they might state the null and alternative hypotheses a little bit differently. So what it, they typically do is they subtract P2 from both sides. So if I subtract P2 from both sides, then what I get is that the difference between my two populations is zero. If I subtract P2 from both sides here, I get P1 minus P2 is less than zero, 
and so on. So again, it depends what kind of program you're using. One might have the alternative hypothesis and the null listed this way, or it might have them listed this way, as in their relationship to zero. They both mean the same thing. Okay. So let's check out a example of doing a two sample hypothesis test and just setting up the alternative and the null hypothesis. You guys cool if I move this? Wait, could I get a second? Yeah, of course. So would you use this kind of test if you don't know the actual population? You would use percentage? this? Um, you definitely could. Usually this is when you want to compare two different groups. Okay. Yeah, so if you want to compare like older and younger folks or something like that. If you don't know the actual population proportion or the thing that you're trying to guesstimate, you would use confidence intervals instead. Okay. Okay. So I have a question. Would P1 sure. and P2 have uh, different characteristics or are they times when they, are, they have the same characteristics? They're going to have the same characteristics. Okay. Yep. So when we do an example, hopefully it'll be more clear. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Evan, do you have this written down? Yep, I'm good. Okay, cool. All right. <clears throat> so, here's kind of a fun example. What we wish to compare T percentage of those who have Facebook. We think more people over <clears throat> 35 have Facebook than those under 35. We randomly collect following data. So we look at people that are older than 35 and we get <clears throat> 141 of them. And we find that roughly about, mm, let's see, find that about 89% of them have Facebook. For people under the age of 35, we get 127 of them. And we find that roughly 75% of them have Facebook.
So the first thing that we should do is we should decide who's going to be our sample one and who's going to be our sample two. So I'm going to say that this group is my sample one. I'm going to say that this group is my sample two. So don't ever change your sample one or your sample two or mix them up while you're doing your statistics or else you will get a totally wrong different answer. All right, now what we're ready to do is that we are ready to state our null and alternative hypothesis. So our null hypothesis is always that we think that these two populations are the same. Always assume that these two populations are the same. Our alternative hypothesis is that we think that people over 35, more of them are gonna have Facebook. So in that case, we think that this group is going to be larger than this group. Which is the same thing as saying that P1 minus P2 equals zero. And that P1 minus P2 is greater than zero. <clears throat> All right, so when you guys have that all written down, go ahead and give me a thumbs up, and then we'll actually run this hypothesis test. Okay. Thanks, Maddie. I have a quick question. Sure, Tali, what's up? So does it matter which one is P1 and P2 when picking, or just as long as you keep them the same? As long as you keep them the same, it doesn't matter. Okay, cool. Okay, good. All right, so here's how you run this hypothesis test. We're not gonna do it by hand because the calculations are just kind of exhausting, to be honest. Um, and it's more important that you know how to set up the hypothesis and interpret your results. So, again, if you go to this hypothesis testing calculator at the bottom of unit six under technology, what you are going to do is this is only for a single proportion. So what we want to do is that we want to look at the difference in proportions. That means that we're going to have um, two. So this is nice because it's labeled just like the one that we just wrote down. So sample one proportion. Well, we saw that 89 of our people above the age of 35 had Facebook. And we had 141 individuals in that sample. In our other sample, we had 75% that had Facebook. And we had 127 people total. Now, when it says the difference in P1 and P2 to test our hypothesis, always leave that at zero. It's always going to be zero. The reason is, is because our null hypothesis is that when you subtract these two, we find the difference at zero. So don't need to change that. And then down here, we have these three alternative hypotheses. Is, so, there, a, is oh. there ever a situation where you would not want them to equal zero? You might have a, um, a suggested difference that you think they might be. So you might think, oh, I think that they're actually like 20% different or something. And then you would set this to 0 0.2. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. All right, so our alternative hypothesis is that we think that P1 minus P2 is greater than this difference, which is zero, as we can see right here on this right-hand side. So we would like to select that one. Our significance level, let's keep it at 5%. We'll hit calculate. So what we see here is our z-score is going to be 3. 
And the thing that we actually really want is that we want that probability, which is 0 0.13. All right, and remember this um, website is so cool because it also tells you what your conclusion should be. So it says that we should reject the null hypothesis because we would expect to see a difference between these sample proportions as extreme as 0.13% of the time under the null hypothesis. So just to get that kind of burnt into our brain, let's go ahead and write it down on our paper. So since our p-value was 0.13%, which is less than alpha, which we set at 5%, which is the same as 0 0.05, we have evidence to reject H naught. Yay! So P is low, reject HO. I don't know why that always feels so good. I love it when we get to reject H naught. It, just, oh, it feels my soul. It's like a nice thing. Okay. Great. So before we move on, does anybody else have any questions on this? Nope, feeling good? Okay. So if you do want to know how to do this by hand, you are more than welcome to do so. You can look in the textbook and it has the formulas. They work just like they do for the single proportion. They're just more complicated. But same thing, you have to find the standard error and then you have to find the Z test statistic, find it on the uh, P table or on the Z table and then you're done. <clears throat> All right, let's do one more and then we'll call it a day. So can anybody think of two groups that we might want to compare? Hayden, what do you think? Cat people and dog people. I don't know. No, I like it. All right, so let's compare cat people and dog people. And what about these two groups do you want to compare? Uh, if they have a backyard. Oh, I like it. So do you have a hypothesis on who's going to have a backyard? I would assume dog people have more backyards than cat people do. Because I assume most cat people live in like urban areas, cities. Yeah, right, or like apartments. Yeah. Yeah, I dig it. So let's say that we ask people who have a cat how many of them have a backyard. And out of the 47 that we asked, it turns out that only 13 had a backyard. And let's say that out of, say we asked 53 dog people. And let's say out of those people, we had 30 that had a backyard. So for the P2, did you mean to put 30 out of 47? Oh, I meant to put 30 out of 53. Thanks, Talia, you're the best. All right, so our null hypothesis is that P1 equals P2, which is the same as saying that their difference is zero.
and our alternative is that we thought that cat people would have less or less cat people would have backyards than dog people. Which is the same as saying that. Now, before we enter this into the website, the first thing that we need to actually do is we need to figure out what these proportions are in decimals. So we actually need to take 13 and divide it by 47. We also need to take 30 and divide it by 53. So this one is going to be 0 0.2766. And this one will be 0 0.5660. Is two de or four decimal places usually a good rule of thumb? Yeah. Okay. When you're doing hypothesis tests, yeah. Good. Thank you for asking. All right. So now that we have those, we are ready to enter in the calculator and see what we find out. I'm going to say that they're very different just by looking at them. So let's get some science behind us to make a better argument. All right, so again, when you go straight to this website, don't forget to go up here and click Difference of Proportions so that you get the right calculator. So our first sample proportion, that's at 0.2766 out of 47 individuals. And the next one is 0.5660. That was out of 53. Okay, and now in this case, we think that P1 minus P2 is going to be less than zero. So we want to pick this third option here. Go ahead and hit calculate. And what we get is we get a P value of 0.11%. So 0.11%, that's very low P level. So what that means is that we found evidence to reject H0, which means that our alternative hypothesis is probably correct. Dog people on average do have more backyards than cat people. I'll go ahead and write that down just for fun. Um, I have a quick question. Yeah. So how, after you like put it into the calculator and figure it all out, how, I'm a little confused on how you figure out if you reject or fail to reject. I'm a little confused like with that. Yeah. So our p-value is 0.11% and our alpha, our significance level is 5%. So since our p-value is less than alpha, that means that we get to reject H0. If your p-value is greater than alpha, that means that you fail to reject H0. OK. That makes more sense. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <clears throat> so in this case, because our p-value is only 0.11% and our alpha is 5%, then we get to reject H0. So what that means is that we found evidence supporting our alternative hypothesis. and can reject H0. Awesome. 
All right. Cool. So actually, what that means is that we have wrapped up unit six in a nice little bow. So tomorrow is going to be study session slash working on your homework slash asking me questions slash asking me to do more examples if you like. So with that said, class is over and I will see you guys tomorrow. Now have a wonderful rest of your day. And if I don't see you tomorrow, I hope you have an amazing weekend. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, guys. Bye. Hey, professor. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, before you go, uh, do you happen to have like any meeting times? Because I just saw your office hours. Do you have anything available for the weekend? Uh, let me check. Oh. One second. Just